There we go. Okay, so again, welcome to our Mosaic Art Project this evening. Um, if you are looking for the other uh, lecture that um, Olivia gave last week, it is on the library's YouTube channel. Um, I will send this out again, just in case, um, you know, you're still working on your project when we're done uh, and you'll, you'll be able to look at this again. But I am glad to have you all here. We, we actually are expecting some other folks, so they may be coming in. Um, but we are glad to have Olivia here from uh, Philadelphia's uh, Magic Gardens. And um, take it away, Olivia. Welcome. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, I'm happy to be here with everyone tonight. And uh, we are going to be making our tile mosaics. And uh, so it seemed like people have their kits. I'll, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the magic gardens and mosaics, but I'm um, just showing everyone here. Here is a little example of what yours might end up looking like. Everyone's is going to look quite different, I'm sure. Um, I have a few examples here. I'll show one more. Um, so we will get to that in just a little bit. Um, so for those of you who were here last week, you might know a little bit about the Magic Gardens. Um, if not, I'm just gonna give a really brief overview and then talk a little bit about the mosaic method that the artist who made the Magic Gardens uses, as well as just some other types of mosaics. So you'll sort of see how what we're making fits in. Um, so, I am going to start by sharing my screen and I'm going to show just a short video. It's about three minutes long that shows um, the Magic Gardens and some people kind of talking about their experiences there, but it really gives you um, a nice feel for what the space is like and maybe some inspiration for making your mosaic. So give me one second here as I share this. One of the first places I visited when I came to Philadelphia was the Magic Gardens and it instantly became a landmark for me. As I get older, I want to keep the things that I find beautiful or the things that are important to me closer and closer and the Magic Gardens represents that for me. For the blind, you don't know something until you touch it, you know, seeing is touching. And for me, the Magic Gardens is all about accessibility because We've worked with the staff to create a touch tour for the blind and visually impaired. To me, the Magic Gardens represents the freedom of creativity and expression and what could happen when you're truly being yourself. It's more than just a place for really good photos. The Magic Gardens does a lot within the community and it's really dedicated to the community. So, um, you know, it's more than just an attraction. It's a stable, it's a pillar. Magic Garden means like self-esteem. What you feel in your heart what you feel in your soul, you feel like a kid coming out here. Para mí, los Magic Gardens es un refugio donde vengo a, o sea, me inspiro a hacer arte eh, y también es un sitio donde no me juzgan y siempre he sido bienvenida. This museum means uh, a different view of art, beauty, and creativity to me. Magic Gardens is a celebration of life. Magisterious, because it's magical and mysterious. Like an oasis, a refuge. That has brought community together. 
magical. <laughs> magical. Come and see it for yourself and you'll be amazed what you see in the magic art. So that just gives you a little taste of what the Magic Gardens is like if you haven't been there before. And um, now I am going to share my screen and um, just talk a little bit here about the Magic Gardens before we get into our project. All right. So if you were here last week, um, you saw some of these photos. So just going through a few photos. Um, so we are a nonprofit museum that's located on South Street, in, just south of Center City in Philadelphia. And this was a work uh, by Isaiah Zagar that he created over about 30 years. And so there is a uh, bi-level outdoor sculpture garden, which is, um, you can see here, uh, covers three city lots. And, um, and, sorry. <laughs> and, um, and then is also the surfaces are all kind of covered with mosaic. So the buildings are the floor and um, inside the ceilings, the walls. So there are mosaics kind of all throughout the space. It's about 3000 square feet of mosaic space. And we are open every day except for Tuesday and we do guided tours and are open for general admission. And I saw Mary put in the chat, um, the library has a museum pass so you can um, take that out and visit the museum for free with that. Um, you do need to reserve tickets online when you have that, but um, you can do that pretty easily through our website. So this is Isaiah Zagar, and he is the artist whose vision this space was. And like I said, he worked on this site for about 30 years. He actually just turned 83. His birthday was on Friday. And he is still working, though not so much at the Magic Gardens. Um, and the Magic Gardens is his largest space that you can come to visit. And as I talked about last week, the reason why he really started making this kind of work was as a form of therapy when he had a mental breakdown and he had attempted suicide and was hospitalized. And it was making this type of work that really allowed him to work through his depression and struggling with his mental health and has been what has really helped him sort of move forward and, um, and that's why he makes so much work. That's why he goes from one project to the next and has really done this for a long time. So you can see this is the Eyes Gallery, the shop that his wife Julia runs at 4th and South, which was the first place he ever mosaiced. And this is their home, which is also fully mosaiced um, inside and out. You can see the outside here. And then he has a big studio warehouse in South Philadelphia, about a mile south of where the Magic Gardens is that we see here. Um, so he does just keep working, but like I said, that's really necessary for him to stay mentally healthy. Um, his mosaicing has really been what's, um, what's colored his whole life. And he has more than 200 public murals. So this is one of them. And here we can get a little bit closer view of what some of these mosaics look like. And I will, um, in a, a minute or two, I'll take you through kind of the process that he uses, which we call the Zagar method. It's really sort of his process that he has developed over the years. And um, but first, I'm just going to show you a few other versions of mosaics, because the kind of mosaics that uh, that Isaiah makes at the Magic Gardens are one particular kind we see here. Um, if you're familiar with other mosaics, if you've made mosaics before, you've probably seen different kinds and they might look very different from what you kind of see at the Magic Gardens. Um, and uh, where this was kind of initially um, inspired by for Isaiah, I'm gonna show you two big influence of his. So one is um, this place that you see right here, which is in um, Chartres, France, and it's called La Maison Piacette, and it's by a man named uh, Raymond Isidore. 
And he uh, covered his whole home, which you can see here, and then a whole outdoor garden space with mosaics. And this is a place that you can visit. It's open as a museum. If you wanna see more photos of what this looks like, um, there's tons of photos online, uh, La Maison Picassiette. And he was really one of the pioneers of the style of mosaic that Isaiah does, which is, um, it's called different things. Sometimes it's a shard style. Um, it's sometimes called Trencadis or Pic Assiette. And that's where the name La Maison Cassiette um, comes from that style of mosaic, Pique Assiette, um, which is sometimes translated as um, plate thief or plate stealer because it uses a lot of um, shards of pottery, tiles, um, ceramics, and has sort of irregular pieces. Those are kind of the hallmarks of this sort of style. The other uh, big influence and probably most well-known person who used this style is Antony Gaudí uh, in Spain, Barcelona. He has lots of work there. And this is Park Well. And it might be a little hard to see the mosaics here. So I'll show you a little bit closer what these look like. And um, he uses this style of mosaic through a lot of his work. He was an architect, um, but he worked with uh, another man um, who was really doing a lot of the mosaics and um and like he this was sort of what he did with a lot of his work he worked with a lot of artisans but these mosaics really became a huge hallmark of his work and so this is um a very long bench that's at Parkwell and then we can see a few other um places where he's used this this is uh Casa Batillo which is also in Barcelona um and Isaiah actually went to see um, the work of Gaudí before he started working on the Magic Garden. So you see um, maybe some similarities between what, what you see at the Magic Gardens between these places, because um, they're definitely big influences of Isaiah's. So one more thing we'll look at um, before we get started are just some older mosaics. Um, someone had asked last week about how old mosaics are. Um, and they, I believe when I, when I looked it up, um, they go back to like the fourth century BC. And um, these are just showing some, this is not the earliest mosaic, but sort of earlier style. And these are more traditional mosaics where often what you see in these is usually that they're very figurative, and also that they're using very sort of uniform pieces to create these, these mosaics. And so this one I always like to show, this is um, at the Basilica in Vatican City and um, St. Peter's Basilica. And when you first look at this, you might think, oh, this is a painting, right? That's sort of what it looks like. But if we look closer, we can see this is actually a mosaic. And um, it's made up of all these very, very tiny pieces that are put together in a very precise way in order to, to create this image. So this whole thing that you're seeing there is made up of all these little pieces. So this is a much more traditional style of mosaic than what we're gonna be doing or what you see at the Magic Gardens, um, but just sort of giving a little context for mosaics as a whole. And then one more that I'll show you um, is actually one that is in Philadelphia. Some people may have seen this. Um, this is the Dream Garden by Maxfield Parish, and it's Tiffany Glass that was used to make this. And um, if you have not seen this and you're in Philadelphia, I would recommend going to see it. It's actually in the lobby of the Curtis Building in Center City. It's free to go in and just see it in the lobby there. Um, and it's a really beautiful piece. And again, this sort of looks like a painting from far away. So I'll show you what it looks like close up is made of these very small pieces of glass and, um, and is just a huge, huge work. Um, it's, that's why it's sort of stretched out here. You can see there's a little um, kind of pool in front of it and it takes up a whole wall 
Um, and the, the fact that it's made of the Tiffany glass gives it almost this sort of iridescent quality when you see it in person where it almost kind of has movement to it too. All right, so I'm just gonna take you through the Zagar method, which we won't really be following today, but we'll be sort of doing um, the same uh, spirit as this. So when Isaiah is working on a big wall, the first thing that he's doing is putting up these um, sort of ovalish pieces that we see that are all over the wall. And he calls those blobs and he makes those from cement before he comes to the wall. So these are things that are pre-made. He's bolting them right into the wall. And then he's creating these really simple line drawings around the blobs. And that is kind of as much planning as he does. And even when he comes to the wall, he does not have this sketched out or anything. He's really just kind of, oh, I'm sorry. Um, he's really just sort of doing this as he goes. And that is very much the method that Isaiah uses and that I often embrace as I'm teaching people um, to, to do this kind of work is that there's a lot of randomness to it. And it's very much sort of the idea that whatever you do is the right thing. There's no mistakes. Um, so he's making these lines and then outlining all of the lines with mirror pieces. So mirror is a big part of the, um, the magic gardens, uh, that there's a lot of mirror in the mosaic. So every line is getting a line of mirror glued right along those lines, and then just filled in with all kinds of other tiles. And this is where the randomness really comes in, where Isaiah has a bucket of tiles. He says, whatever tile you pull out, that's the perfect one. Wherever you place it, that's the perfect place. So if you want to follow that method today, I would suggest trying it. Some people have, um, you know, want to plan their things out much more carefully, which is fine too. Um, but that's the method that has, is used for most of the mosaics at Philadelphia's Magic Gardens. And then you can see once the tiles are all glued down, they need about a day to set for the glue to dry. And then the blue part that we see here at the bottom, that is the grout or the, the cement mixture, which is being put over top of the tiles and it's filling in all of those spaces so that it creates a really strong bond between all these pieces. Now we are not gonna use grout today, but we're gonna sort of do a technique to make it look kind of like grout. Because again, as I mentioned, doing grout is something where you really need a day for the, the tiles to set. And so we're gonna be doing a much sort of quicker process here. And then we can see the finished mosaic here. So it's been fully grouted, all the tiles cleaned off, and then those lines painted in again. So that is the, the Zegar method, and that's the process. If you come to the Magic Gardens, if you've been to the Magic Gardens, this is the process that um, pretty much all of those pieces have gone through. So does anyone have questions about anything before we get to making our mosaics? Hi, I think my son has a question. Sure. Um, how do you place them on if they're not very flat? That's a great question. So yeah, so let's, we'll start. Um, are you talking about our mosaic that we're making or the ones that we saw in the- Yeah, picture? the pieces aren't that flat. So how do you place them? Good question. So let's, yeah, let's start making and I will answer that here. So what you wanna do to start off is, um, is to get out your square tile like this. And um, so, you know, these are tiles that you might use in a mosaic, but for our purpose, this is going to be the base for our mosaic today. And, and we are actually going to mosaic on the side that is unglazed. So you should have, a, there's a glazed side, which is that smooth kind of slippery side. We're gonna be working on the other side, the side that is more matte, um, a little rough, a little bumpy, and that's gonna help us glue everything on there. Okay, so if anyone has, and, and two, we're a fairly small group here, so if people do have questions, feel free to, yeah, unmute and you can just ask, that's fine. Or you can put it in the chat if you feel more comfortable doing it. Olivia, so I was, um, I was just gonna mention that the, the dream garden, the one yeah. that's at the Curtis building, um, so people may remember that that was actually um, 
threatened. I mean, it was actually, there was some talk that Steve Wynn, who is the kind of the big uh, casino guy here, was actually going to move that to Las Vegas in the summer of 1998. And I, I had started to work around the corner from it. I remember feeling like I needed to get over there to see it because there was some concern that he was literally going to take that entire piece of work and move it to Las Vegas. So I'm really glad that didn't happen, but um, yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, no, that, that memory came saying. back when you showed it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that is a, a wild story, but happy it's still here in Philadelphia. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, so then the other thing you need to start off is your glue, and we are just going to cover that whole unglazed side with glue to start off with. So you really want to put it on the whole surface. It doesn't need to be dripping off your tile, but you do want to make sure that there's glue on pretty much every part of the surface. So I usually, I don't know if people can sort of see what I'm doing here. I usually will just go across and I'm just filling in to cover the whole thing. So, so you want to kind of just do that until you have glue all around the edges on every part. You can kind of use the nozzle just to um, to fill it in and get a good coating. I'm making a little bit of a mess here, but um, so you can see just like that. I have uh, so I'm going to do that on the whole surface. If it's easier for you with these bottles, everyone should have like a a new bottle of glue there in your kit. But um, for future, like if you're doing this and you don't, and it's hard to squeeze out like this, um, or maybe it hurts your hand to do that, you could also use like a paintbrush or something to cover it. You just want to make sure, like I said, that it has a pretty thick coat on there. And it's fine if there's a few little areas that are not covered, that's not gonna be a big deal. So you can see there's mine. I know my light is not great here, but um, with the glue all the way over. And then I would just suggest putting it flat on the table, glue side up. That's probably gonna be the easiest way for you to work. So as people are doing that, I'm gonna get some of my pieces out here. So in your bag, you have a bunch of different pieces. You'll have some bigger things, some smaller things. And this is where everyone's is gonna end up looking different because everyone got some kind of different things in their bag. Um, and also this is where you really get to choose how you want your, your mosaic to look. So, um, yeah, we had a great question about if things are not flat, right? How do we glue them on there? Even with this just Elmer's glue that we're using, um, it's going to be pretty strong. And um, so, and it will take a little while to fully dry. Um, but as long as the piece, so I have this little piece here, which you can see is kind of curved. Um, as long as your piece has a good contact part um, on the glue, it will stick. It'll dry on there and stick. So this one is gonna be a little easier because the curved part is probably the part I want to put down. So I'm just gonna set it right on there. But let's say, let me see if I have one. You have a curved piece, especially if you have like a broken, um, here we go, here I have one. Um, if you have like a broken part of a plate or a cup or something like that, which some of you might have in your pieces, that yes, is more curved, you just want to make sure that there is some part of it, if, even if it's just the edges, that is sitting in the glue. So sort of get it situated. I'm going to hold my piece up here that I just stuck. I don't know how well people will be able to see. That's the one thing about doing this on Zoom. So you can kind of see, I have this up here. It's not fully in the glue, you can kind of see there, but it is sitting in the glue enough 
that if I give that a little while to just sort of sit and dry there, it's going to be fine. Okay, so I would say that's the biggest thing is just making sure that when you put it down, you feel that it's going into the glue. That's why we kind of want to make sure we have that thick coat of glue and the glue is going to dry clear. Um, and we're also going to kind of cover up any spots that are not covered. So this is where you can just start filling in your pieces. Again, I'm going to show you one that is already finished. Um, so you can kind of see what that looks like. And so you can put your pieces really close together if you want to. You can leave a little bit more space in between. You can, um, you can stand things up. Sometimes people like to make it more three-dimensional. Um, you can use a lot of bigger pieces, a lot of smaller pieces, a mix. It's really totally up to you. I would say if you are thinking of using some of the bigger pieces, you're probably going to want to start with those so you don't run out of room and then kind of fill in with some other things. But again, the whole thing does not need to be covered unless you want it to be. Um, because what we're going to do with the sand that you have is once we kind of have all our pieces on there as we want them to be, we're going to dump the sand over top. So it's going to fill in everywhere between the tiles where there's glue. So it's going to stick to that glue. And that's what for us is going to be instead of the grout, it's going to kind of have a look like grout. So it's not really going to be holding anything together, but it is going to give it that background color um, like you see at the, the Magic Gardens and and it gives that sort of look like grout. Now, um, I'm gonna show you one other example as you're working here, which is that if you don't, if you decide you don't wanna use the sand, that's fine too. So I have an example right here where um, whoever made this decided they did not wanna use the, the sand. And so they just let it dry and you can see that the glue dried. You can't see any of the glue. You just sort of see the background of the tile and it looks pretty cool too. So anyone have questions as you're working here? So I have a question. Sure. This is Kara. Hi, Kara. Uh, so I, I had a few projects in my mind that usually uh, the top surface I would like them to be flat. Okay. Like so, in that case, how I'm gonna um, choose the pieces? How I'm gonna make the pieces uh, even on the top surface? So let's say, what do you call that? Let's say, um, I don't know, like if I wanna use it in the in the kitchen, for example, like a tray or something, right? Yeah, so that's a great question. Yes, so if you were doing that, um, if you wanted to make a mosaic like that, you would want all of your pieces to be either the same and not necessarily the same color, but maybe the same type of tile or um, whatever you're using, or you wanna make sure they're the same thickness. And so, as you've probably seen by what we gave you, we give you kind of all different kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, for this project, that's probably not possible, but um, yes, if you wanna do that, I would say you just kind of wanna stick with materials that are all the same thickness, which could be things that are really thick. Um, like I've got, you know, some really big tile here, or it could be something that's much thinner. Like I have this piece of mirror, but you're right. Yes. If you want something to be kind of flat and smooth, um, you're not going to want to use like this piece of mirror with this big fat piece of tile, because then when you would go to grout something like that, or even if you're not grouting it and you're sort of putting the tiles next to each other, it's going to be very sort of uneven and bumpy which for our project today is really not a big deal, but you're right. If you wanted to do that on a tray or like a tabletop or countertop or something, that would be really important. Um, especially like at the Magic Gardens, a lot of our floors are mosaic. And so that's one of the places where um, Isaiah and now our preservation team are very careful about 
trying to use tiles that are all kind of the same thickness so that the floor is not super bumpy, which if you've been to the Magic Gardens, it is a lot of places, um, but it's not the easiest place to walk around. So yeah, great question, Kara. Did that answer what you were wondering? Yes, yes, you asked. <laughs> so um, when I was searching, I found I came across with some other options, uh, especially the very first interesting one was uh, what do you call that step stone? So mm -hmm. I believe the technique with the step stone is the kind of like an upside down. You they you put the stones first or or the tiles first, and then pull the ground out, and then let it dry so that you can have the uh, flat surface maybe. But mm -hmm. I don't know if it is possible with every. Uh, tile or every type of um, stone because yes you I don't know how to find all the same uh, thickness yeah yeah so yeah I think what you're talking about is um, if you you well there's there's two ways you could sort of do it and they um, if you looked up mosaic methods you would probably see this because this is pretty common with mosaics that um, they're sort of like direct methods which is what we're doing today where you're you're gluing the tiles down exactly as they're going to be in the end um, there are like indirect methods which is where you can your um, you are kind of lining everything up and then um, your like flipping it kind of you're not you're not gluing it to where where it's going to be if that makes sense um and um and there's yeah if you were making a stepping stone you could sort of do that either way where you could put the things face down and pour the grout in and then flip it or you could also um probably glue everything and then do it and you would just want to in the grouting stages where you can kind of um smooth everything out but yeah you would you would want to use those same um same size pieces so there is no option to cut those tiles in like from the like like to make them even right there is no such a thing i guess um you, you can cut them to make them smaller but is it even possible to cut oh, them and make them in even even uh, even thickness you not i would say not, not really so, yeah. talking about if you have a bunch of tiles and then you want to try to make them the same thickness yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i would say that um as far yeah. as i know that is not yeah. possible okay no problem thank you yeah okay so how are people doing with their put in their pieces on? I see some people are still working. Okay, great. I got a thumbs up for Mary. Um, yeah, great. Arlene, give me a thumbs up. All right, great. Yeah, I see. <laughs> I got your thumbs up there. Thank you. All right, good, good, good. Um, so yeah, I mean, and you can work on this for as long as you want. I will say the other thing that's nice about this is that the, the glue will take a while to dry, but that also means that you have quite a bit of time to work. So you don't need to, to go really fast. And actually sometimes it's sort of nice because as the glue dries, it will get a little tackier. And so it's kind of easier to stick those pieces. They're not gonna move around quite as much. Um, so I'm gonna quickly finish mine here. I've been doing too much talking and not enough making my mosaic. Um, and you can kind of see from the stuff that we we gave you to make your mosaic that you can use all sorts of different things um, for mosaicing. So tiles are probably the most common, but um, you know we've given you some other things. And we also, um, when we're making, sometimes we make really tiny kind of mosaic projects that beads are great, um, any little rhinestones and, gems are really good. I also always tell people like I just keep a a little jar like in my kitchen and anytime I find some little thing that I think 
oh, you know, I'm going to throw this away. What do I need this for? I usually just throw it in there. And they're often really good things to use for mosaics, like these little can tabs or bottle caps are great. Um, pieces that break off of things like toys or, um, you know, something else that you might be throwing away. Um, even some, I don't know if anyone has any of these in their bag, but we um, dyed pasta. Um, you can dye pasta with food coloring and vinegar and get really brilliant colors. And that can be a way to, to, um, to make a bunch of different color things pretty easily. Um, obviously that's not, if you're gonna put it outside or something, that's not great, but um, little gems like this. So a lot of different things you can use for mosaics. All right, so if people are um, getting maybe towards the end, I'm gonna show you the next thing because this step, um, you can do this with me or you can also uh, wait until you feel um, ready to do this. But um, once you kind of have all your pieces on, you're feeling good with it. If you want to add the sand, um, we're just gonna dump it right over the top. And so um, the idea with this, like I said, is that the sand is going to cover any area where we have glue that we didn't glue something else down, which is normally what your grout would be doing. It would be filling in all of those pieces, but since we're not using grout, the sand is gonna kind of serve for this. So um, I would also suggest um, when you are doing this, dumping it over something. So I just have like a little plate here that I'm gonna do it on. You know, you could, um, you could do it on a plate or a bowl um, or even just like a paper towel or something, something that's gonna be easy for you to sort of uh, get rid of the excess so you don't have sand all over the place. Um, even uh, I've seen people do it just right over the trash can. The only thing with that is if you use all your sand and then you decide you wanna go back again and try to fill something in, um, your sand will be in the trash can. So that may not be great, but um, so we can sort of see, I'm gonna show mine quickly. The Whenever I do this on Zoom, it's always a little hard because, and I would, um, I would love to see anything that people are doing, but I would also caution you that sometimes trying to hold it up to the camera means your pieces are gonna start falling off. So only hold it up to show us if you want to, but I'm gonna show, show mine because I don't, care too much if my pieces fall off of it. Um, so I'm just gonna hold this up sort of quickly. You can see I've got all my pieces on there. One just fell off, uh, but I'm gonna put it right back on. Um, and I'm just gonna pour the glue, or I'm sorry, not the glue. The I'm gonna pour the um, sand right over top of that. So it's going to fill in all those spots and you really, you probably, oh, I see someone already did it. Lorna, great, great, great. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so you're just kind of sprinkling the sand over. You probably noticed you don't have a lot of sand in your bag and you really don't need a lot. Um, like I said, if you kind of go, you wanna just try to make sure you're getting it in between all of those pieces so that it is covering over everything. And then the last step, which this is one where, unless you feel like your pieces are really stuck on there, I would suggest waiting a little while to do this. Um, you're just gonna pick it up and shake it off. So, um, so you're just gonna kind of shake, shake, shake everything off until all of the sand that's on top of the tiles and it, whatever you glued on has come off. And the nice thing about this, and it's actually the same thing that happens with the grout, is that uh, the nature of the grout is that it's not gonna stick to anything that is glazed or sort of slippery. So that's why we use these glazed tiles. We use like the china 
um, the ceramics, the mirror, even like the beads and the rhinestones, all of those things, the grout is not going to stick to it. Same thing with the sand. It's not going to stick to any of those things. So you can leave it on there for a while and let the glue really dry. Oh, great. I see Angela. We've got a whole bunch there. They look wonderful. Um, and, and then once you feel like, okay, my pieces are really dry, you can just pick it up and kind of shake everything off. And you can see, you know, with these, it does really kind of give the illusion that you have the grout there. It gives that nice background color. Um, if you wanted to try this again with something else, you know, you can get all different kinds of sand um, to give you different background colors. Um, and, and so that's kind of it. That's as easy as it is. Um, and this is, um, again, a pretty quick process. Normal mosaics can be really quick too, but you do sort of need that time in between. But um, you can use the same kind of idea that we did here tonight to, to create a mosaic like that. Olivia, can I, can I make a request to everybody? Yeah. Um, so uh, the library has created a, a, a space on our website, which is kind of a, an art gallery. Um, and I, um, we've started to um, collect when we've, we've done some of these projects, uh, like in the fall, we did something called the tiny art gallery and people were uh, getting these little tiny canvases and they were painting like their favorite book. They actually turned them in and we actually uh, exhibited, them, exhibited them at the library. But we also took pictures of them and they're now on our, um, on our, our space. Uh, in, uh, on the website. So uh, my request to everybody is when you're finally done, take a picture and send it to me because uh, I would like to include it in our um, our online gallery space. I'd love to see everybody what everybody ended up doing. Um, and I will send you because you registered, I will send you a reminder. Uh, but I, I just wanted to kind of give a personal invitation to everybody to to send me a picture of your uh, tile at the end so that we can um, exhibit it to everyone. We're going to start sanding now. Nice. Great. Go I for it. Show you. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah, it looks beautiful. I love all the different colors that you use. I know. So anyway, that was my request to everybody. Send me a picture. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah, so if anyone has any last questions or comments or wants to share, feel free to do that. You can use your bag and use it as like a napkin so that you don't need um, to clean up your sand. Good idea. <laughs> so Olivia, tell, tell folks, uh, I mean, I think your description of how many of these materials came came to be in our bag is great um but i was wondering you know say i want to do more um and i'm not sure maybe where the to get the tile or maybe where to get the sand where, where would you recommend people to go yeah that's a great question so uh, for the materials like if you're looking for tiles or broken china um i would check a few places you can get a lot of things for free or very little money because a lot of times people are kind of trying to get rid of that kind of stuff um so if you look on like craigslist sometimes people you search for tiles or china or things like that uh, a lot of times people are just kind of trying to get rid of it like if you're willing to pick it up from them um, they may just give it to you um, checking with like tile companies or um, you know home improvement like supply companies that sell tile you sometimes can get things, they'll have things that are broken or have been like discontinued, um, especially places where they have a lot of samples of tile. They often are throwing them away after, you know, something 
they're not, they don't sell that anymore, or they have like the new season style, they're often looking to get rid of those things. Um, they can be really great places. Thrift stores, you know, you can find a lot of old China. And what we do with most of these tiles um, and the plates and things like that are often things that we get donated. And you can just um, wear like a glove on your hand, like a work glove and break it right in your hand with a hammer is, is pretty easy to kind of get the smaller pieces. Um, if you're looking for more sort of uniform pieces, you can buy a lot of different kinds of tile from craft or art supply stores. Um, and same with the, the colored sand, that's where I get it. It's just like art sand that you could buy at a craft store. Um, you know, you could also just use regular sand too. Uh, and that's not a color if you just wanted a sort of neutral background color. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say a lot of, even sometimes not for tiles, but other materials looking like at the dollar store, they sometimes have good little bags of stuff that's great for mosaics. Um, I think the, the kind of exciting thing about mosaics is that you can use so many different materials that, um, you know, looking, looking all over thing, places that you might not normally think of art supplies, you can often find things. Just one more, more question that I have. Um, so if I'm not going to tile it into my backsplash in my kitchen, mm -hmm. uh, what are some ways to display our art? Um, yeah, I think these are kind of nice because, um, you know, they're, they're small, but they're still kind of a nice size to display. Um, you can get those little um, stands that just kind of, you even use them like for books sometimes, thinking of the mm -hmm. library, yep. um, <laughs> that are where you can just kind of set it in there and it's propped up. Um, those are usually fairly cheap to, to buy places like, like they sometimes say they're for displaying plates or something like that, but they're, they're great for displaying tiles. Um, I've also used um, to hang it like on the wall if you wanted to do something like that. Plate hangers, they're like elastic. Um, they have like springs in them. And so again, they're meant for plates, but they work well for little mosaics like this. Um, and, or, you know, it's something you could also kind of prop up somewhere or have it flat um, on a table. Those are some different ways I've seen people yeah. display them, yeah. Go ahead, I, I did a, Oh, go ahead, Marianne. So in the Magic Gardens of South Lake, it's very, um, it's really heavy. So did you have to put in like foundations to support the weight of all of that work? Because, I mean, I've been to Spain, so I've seen Gadeo stuff there. I mean, it, it would need tremendous support to be stable. <laughs> Yeah, people ask that a lot, and um, I I will say I am I don't have an engineering background, but uh, we have had a lot of engineers come to the space and and look at the mosaics, particularly in the outdoor section. Yes, and um, there are places where we have uh, have added support to to different parts of the the structure. Um, a lot of the, this is not so much the mosaics, but a lot of the things that are sort of built up do have rebar um, inside them. That's kind of supporting it. Yes. As, as far as the actual walls, most of those don't have any kind of extra support on them. And um, our preservation team, so we have three full-time staff members who are just in charge of caretaking the, the artwork. They're kind of constantly checking those things and they do sometimes have to take areas down and then put them up again. Um, but for the most part, um, the, the engineers that have come and looked at things say, you know, everything is looking good and is very stable. So um, yeah, for the most part, it doesn't, doesn't seem to need extra support, but it is kind of, yes, I've had a lot of people ask about that, the weight, the extra weight, which I can't imagine um, how much it is total, like on the building. Yeah. It's daunting when you see, like visually when you see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's like, you think too, you feel just our little tile mosaic here, how heavy that is to think about that times, you know, several thousand. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great question. 
other questions for Olivia? How, how did everybody's turn out? I'm, I'm, I can't wait to see all your pictures. I have a question, Olivia. Oh, nice. Yeah, go ahead, mom. Um, so my husband and I and you know our son, we've been just in awe of the Magic Gardens. Um, and I'm wondering, like, you know, how often do you have these kind of uh, mosaic workshops? Um, you know, I don't live in the city, but you know, it'd be nice if I knew um, how often they were happening. If you offered summer camps for kids, because I think this is so great. Like, um, my son's school, like, you know, they're always they they always sort of you know the teachers phrase junk as beautiful materials, and you know they're always creating, um, you know, inventing and you know putting things together and just placing things together in different perspectives. And I'm wondering if you have kids program that, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we we don't unfortunately have a, a full summer camp. Um, we, we just sort of don't have the space uh, right now for something like that. But we do um, a lot, we do outreach programs like this, poor kids. Um, we also have school field trips that that can come or, you know, summer camps, people can come and take guided tours that we have for all ages from pre-K up to adults. Um, and then we do have a, a family program the second Sunday of every month um, called Pico Family Jams. And it is a drop-in program. So it's from 12 to four, the second Sunday of every month. And it is included with admission. So like if you were to use the library pass to come visit, it would be included with your tickets. And we do a different hands-on project every month. Um, so sometimes they're mosaic themes, sometimes they're different. Um, actually our upcoming one that will be April 10th is with Al Bustan Seeds of Culture. So we'll actually be making mosaics that Sunday, but they'll be um, in, in the style of sort of Islamic um, mosaic, so kind of different style from um, what we see at um, the Magic Gardens. Um, and yeah, we do a different project and that's for all ages. Um, it's not just for, for kids. Um, and we also do family friendly guided tours of the basement, which is only open for guided tours. And that's also included with admission on those Sundays. I was, uh, we were talking before we began about the, about Isaac and his, uh, the redemptive qualities of mosaics in terms of helping his, you know, with his mental health. And I think just doing this short project, I, I feel calmer. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but, um, you know, I, I, I guess I can see it. <laughs> I can see it. That's not anybody else feels that way so other questions for Olivia so how overnight let it really sit overnight before yeah I would to... suggest if you let it sit overnight it should be totally dry by the morning and you could even like I said about you know not if you don't want to try to clean off the sand right now you could even let it sit overnight and then knock all the extra sand off tomorrow okay if there aren't any other questions, I just wanted to thank you, Olivia, so much. It's been great to, to hear you both last week and this week. Um, for, you know, if you have friends who, who signed up and picked up their kits and wasn't here tonight, I did record this. Uh, and so I will send it out to our registration list. So if you haven't done it, um, you can, um, I, I will send that out to you. Um, and, uh, and again, just a reminder, once your, once yours is set, take a picture and send it to me. I, again, I will send you a reminder tomorrow, uh, and you'll have my email again that you can, uh, you can send that to me. Um, there is a question in the chat. Where can we find more information about the, the next mosaic? Um, could you just ad ad address yeah. that, Olivia? Yeah. So I just put our website in there and the... The program that I was talking about is Pico Family Dreams. All right. Well, thanks everybody for being here. It was great to see you, Olivia, and to 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 do your to do our project. And um, yeah, thanks for having I hope, me. Every, hope everybody has a great night. Thank you very much. Thank you.